Welcome to EC165. This is the third lecture on sequential logic. So in the prior two lectures, we were discussing the basics of sequential logic, and then we finally got into how to build latches. So what we'd like to do now today is understand how we're going to build flip-flops. Okay, uh, flip-flop, I guess, uh, let me say flip-flop design. Okay, so it turns out we already have all the tools needed to build flip-flops because flip-flops are generally created by putting together two latches. Okay, so we already know how to build latches, so all we have to do is put together two latches in a master uh, slave configuration. Okay, so uh, again, best way to try and understand this is let's look at an example. So let's say our input D is coming in here. And let's go ahead and just build a dynamic flip-flop. So we'll start by building a dynamic latch. In this case, we have clock up here and clock bar down here. Note that this is a uh, uh, different polarity than perhaps we're used to looking at. Then we take the output of this latch and put it into the input of a second latch. In this case, note the polarity difference of this latch over here, clock bar on the bottom PMOS transistor there. And then take it through another inverter, and this would be equal to Q bar. Okay, so what do we have going on here? We have latch one, call this latch one, and we have latch two over here, latch two. Okay, and uh, just to be uh, very clear here, I just wanna make a note, note opposite polarities. Okay, uh, so what we, the convention here is we keep the clock bars on the bottom and the clocks on top, and then we switch the NMOS or PMOS in order to indicate the polarity. So let's go ahead and, and try and understand how this works. And uh, as you may have guessed, the best way to do this is by drawing a timing diagram. So let's go ahead and start with our main clock signal here. Go something like this. Okay, so let's say that this is our clock. So let's go ahead and just uh, bring some dotted lines down here to make sure that we can align our timing diagram correctly. Okay, now let's imagine input D starts off at zero and then goes to one. It stays at one and then during the, when the clock is high here, it changes and then it comes down and then stays down for the rest of this example, okay? What I'd like to do is I want to look at node X. Let's call node X up here after that second inverter. Okay, so node X is going to look like what? Well, uh, what is node X? Node X is after this first latch. Now this first latch is transparent when clock is low because clock bar is hitting the NMOS and clock is hitting the, the PMOS device and is in the hold mode when clock is high. Okay, so what we can say then is that when clock is low, uh, latch one is in the transparent mode. So let's just go ahead and write that. L1 is in the transparent mode. And when clock is high, L, sorry, L1 is in the hold mode. Okay, so now let's complete the timing diagram for X. So when clock is low, latch one is in the transparent mode. So X just follows D. Uh, with a certain time delay. Note that there's two inverters here, so X is, is uh, a non-inverted output. And then once we get into when clock is high, L1 is in the hold mode, so it doesn't matter what D does, it dips down here, but it you know, doesn't make a difference. Okay, now let me just draw a few things here. We have a D to Q delay, or rather a D to X delay if we wanted to be more precise here. Okay. Now let's go ahead and draw Q bar. Okay, so we'll just draw Q bar as the variable itself. So Q bar is the output of latch two. Latch two is our normal latch uh, polarity that we typically have. So when clock is high, 
we say that latch two is in the transparent mode. And when clock is low, latch two is in the hold mode. Okay, so Q bar uh, is in the hold mode. We don't know what Q bar was before this uh, whole thing happened. Uh, so eh, let's just assume that it was logic one. Technically, we don't actually know what the logic value was. Now, when clock goes high, then what ends up happening is Q bar is going to now, um, or latch two rather, goes into the transparent mode. So whatever is at its input then becomes its output, although in this case it's inverted. Okay, so X is at its input, so the output is going to go to zero. And note here that this is actually going to be a clock to Q delay because it's the positive edge of clock that's causing this delay to happen. Now, because X is constant during uh, when clock is high because latch one is in the hold mode, then this just stays constant for the whole period here. So let's now go into the second period of operation. In this case, uh, or the second uh, phase of the operation. In this case, L1 goes back into the transparent mode. Okay, so we can go ahead and plot what happens to X. X is basically just a replica of what D is uh, with a slight delay, right? So in this case, D was high, it stays high, goes down here, and then stays down. So this is a D to Q, or I guess a D to X delay. So likewise, latch two is in the hold mode. So Q bar, whatever it was in the previous cycle, it's just gonna hold on here. It's not gonna change, okay? So then on the final uh, cycle, at least in this diagram, latch one enters the hold mode and latch two enters the transparent mode. Okay, so what happens? Uh, so uh, whatever X was before will now be the output uh, or it's gonna just be held. And Q bar is now going to change uh, with respect to whatever X happens to be. X happens to be zero here. And so therefore Q bar is going to go to logic one. And this is a clock to, to Q delay, or I guess technically a clock to Q bar delay. Okay, so basically what's happening here is we see that there are output events at the positive clock edges only, which is exactly what we wanted our flip-flop to behave like, okay? And so the reason that this happens, the way that you can think about it, is this first latch is basically just queuing up the data to input into latch two, which then allows latch two to pass this data through only when clock goes high. But as soon as it passes the data when clock goes high, latch one all of a sudden enters the hold mode. And so any input changes at input D are not going to affect what's passing through latch two because it can't get through latch one. So latch one is kind of acting as the gatekeeper to latch two after clock goes high. But then once clock goes low, latch one allows the data to get through to latch two, but latch two won't latch in that data for lack of a better word until the clock goes high. So in this manner, we're able to get this master-slave configuration that allows output events to only happen on the positive edge of the clock. Now, in this example, we built a positive edge-triggered flip-flop. If you swapped the polarity of the clocks, you would build a negative edge-triggered flip-flop. So what we showed on the previous slide was a version of a dynamic flip-flop. But for all the reasons we didn't really like dynamic latches, those reasons are all still true for flip-flops. So in general, we tend to prefer trying to use static flip-flops when we can. So what that means is when we go ahead and build you know, a normal flip-flop for use in robust digital applications, we typically build it out of static latches. Okay, so what I'm gonna show here is the most popular flip-flop design. Okay, there's many different variants of flip-flops. In fact, interestingly, you can still find new publications in, for example, the Journal of Solid State Circuits and elsewhere on flip-flop design, which is a little surprising to me, but, uh, but I guess there's still always room for improvement. But you know, if you open up a standard cell library, you take a look at the flip-flops inside, you'll probably find one that looks like this or very similar to this. Okay, so this is a clock into a PMOS there, clock bar 
into an NMOS, and then we go into another inverter, but to make this static, this inverter has feedback, like so, uh, with a tri-state inverter, just like we're making it into a static latch. And then between this latch and the next latch, we have another transmission gate, clock, clock bar, the bottom of this transmission gate, into a inverter. This inverter then also again has feedback into a tri-state inverter. In this case, the polarity of that tri-state inverter has been flipped. Note the change in the bubbles on this tri-state inverter. And then we take this output and pass it through another inverter and that gives us Q. And then we take this output over here. If we want access to Q bar, we can get it there too. Okay, so this is very robust. That's the reason we use it. There's a ton of transistors in here, right? There's a bunch of inverters, tri-state inverters, transmission gates, uh, and so on. We have extra inverters at the output that we don't technically need, but uh, we like the uh, properties of having you know, low output impedance so that if there's any noise on the output line, it doesn't couple right back into this positive feedback network of the cross-coupled inverters. So this is uh, a very robust design, and this is what people tend to use in digital design even though it has a ton of transistors. Okay, so let's just go ahead and, and try and understand how this circuit is working. Uh, and to do so, I'd like to just look at what's happening to everything when clock is equal to zero and when clock is equal to one. Okay, so let's first start with clock equal to zero. So we have D going into this inverter and I'm just going to represent these transmission gates and tri-state inverters as switches just to you know, ease our, our mind a little bit. So this first transmission gate when clock is zero is on. So I'm just going to draw this as a closed switch. Then it goes through another inverter. There's feedback here and uh, another inverter. And then it goes into an open switch and connects back over here. Okay. And then this transmission gate up here is open. Then we go into another inverter, which has an inverter and feedback. And in this case, the feedback switch is closed as follows. And I'm gonna ignore that Q bar path and just focus on the, the Q path for now. Okay, so again, what we're saying here is that in this mode of operation, when clock is zero, we say latch one is transparent and latch two is in the hold mode. Okay, and so again, this is the key to operation. So when clock is zero, latch one is in the transparent mode. So any changes at the input can get through latch one, but latch two is sitting there in the hold mode. No changes can propagate through to the output until clock goes high. Okay, so when clock goes high, clock equals one, then the scenario obviously changes. So we have D come through our first inverter here. And then in this case, this first transmission gate is open, goes through an inverter. The feedback network here now is activated. So this tri-state inverter is on as follows. This transmission gate is closed, go through another inverter, but in this case, the feedback network is open. So it's in the transparent mode, and then we go through to the output queue over here. So again, in this case, what we're saying is that latch one is in the hold mode and latch two is in the transparent mode. Again, so what happens here is when clock goes high, then latch one goes into the hold mode. So any changes at the input can no longer propagate through latch one. But latch two then goes into the transparent mode. So whatever was being at the output of latch one 
instantly, well, not instantly, after a propagation delay, passes through latch two and arrives at the output. Okay, so this is the way that these uh, flip-flops work, is in this, this kind of master-slave uh, configuration. So what I'd like to switch to now is, now that we understand how latches and now flip-flops are built at the transistor level, what I'd like to do is go through some exercises and try and see if we can understand how to derive or how to predict what the setup and hold time would be for a latch or a flip-flop. So predicting setup and hold times. Okay, so to do this, uh, well, we're gonna do this calculation using a dynamic latch. Okay, so let's say we have input D, or sorry, a dynamic uh, flip-flop, I should say. So D comes in here, goes through an inverter, enter a transmission gate. This is uh, Q and Q bar, I'm oh, sorry, not Q, uh, phi. and phi bar, then this goes through another inverter into another transmission gate, phi and phi bar, and finally through a final inverter here. Okay, now this creates output Q bar. Okay, so I'd like to label some nodes here. We have W, X, Y, Z. All right, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at the timing diagram of this when we vary where D changes uh, in this structure here, okay? Now let's let TINV, the parasitic, or sorry, the propagation delay of an inverter, say be equal to 10 picoseconds, and the parasitic delay, sorry, propagation delay of a transmission gate to be equal to say five picoseconds. Now this is you know arbitrary, but um, let's say that that's that's true. Okay. So uh, again, best way to understand this is through a timing diagram. So let's go ahead and draw this timing diagram. Let's say phi is low, and then it goes high here. Okay. Let's say D is low and rises here. So the question is, we're trying to, in this particular case, latch in or clock in a logic one at input D. Okay, so we're trying to, 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 to latch in this, this rised value. So let's take a look at output W. So W is, is literally just an inverted version of D with a 10 picosecond delay. Okay, so let's imagine that one of these squares in my slide here is equal to five picoseconds. And so that takes two squares and then it comes down. So this is the delay from D to W, that's 10 picoseconds. Okay, so is this, is this working? Well, W gets to this transmission gate. We're trying to latch in in, in this first latch, D equals to one, which means W equals to zero, but W is arriving at the input to this transmission gate after the transmission gate has changed. Okay, so this is actually not working. Okay, so for, for that reason, or, or rather we say, actually, you know what, let me use red here, because red means bad. Okay, so what we mean by that is X was supposed to transition, but because the edge came after the rising edge of, of the clock phi, this doesn't work, okay? So we say that this doesn't work. We have a setup time violation. Okay, so hopefully that's clear why that doesn't work, okay? So let's go ahead and now derive what the optimal case would be for a setup time or what, what the minimum setup time needed would have to be. Okay, so 
effectively what we do is, in this case, edge D was too close to the rising edge of the clock. So what we have to do is push edge D out until we can just get through that transmission gate. Okay, um, so in this case, I'm going to say that this is going to be, uh, I'm not going to redraw clock phi, but we have to have D valid just before three boxes prior to this rising edge of the clock. And the reason that's the case is no W, as we said, if each box was five picoseconds, no W takes um, 10 picoseconds to get through, that's 10 picoseconds. And then we require five picoseconds to get through node X. Okay, so node X is just a, um, it's just following whatever's happening at W. And so this happens right here. Uh, note how I said just before three boxes away. Uh, this is uh, five picoseconds. Okay, so in this case, this actually uh, works. And I suppose I should use a different color. Maybe I'll use purple. Okay, so this works. So we say this is the bare minimum D has to be valid before the rising edge of the clock. So we can say here that T setup is equal to 10 picoseconds through the delay of that inverter plus five picoseconds through the delay of the transmission gate. This is equal to 15 picoseconds. Okay, so as long as input D is valid 15 picoseconds before the rising edge of the clock, we should be okay in this particular case. So the previous slide showed how we uh, calculated the setup time. I just uh, repopulated the, the diagram here because we will refer to it again when we now go ahead and compute the whole time. Okay, so in this particular case, we're trying to uh, figure out how long after the rising edge of the clock must we hold input D in order for the correct data to get latched in. Let's just go ahead and draw our vertical axis here. So what I'm going to suggest here is input D is rising here. Okay, and this is the value that we are trying to latch. Okay, so let me just, uh, this is the value uh, trying to latch. As it turns out, we don't need to hold the data for too long after the rising edge of the clock. In fact, we can hold the data before, or rather we can release the data before the rising edge of the clock even happens. Okay, so that sounds a little weird, but hear me out. Okay, so W as we know is just the inverted version of D, inverted by two clock cycles like so. Okay, um, so this is 10 picoseconds and 10 picoseconds. Now what about X? Note X is just following whatever W is doing in the transparent mode of latch one with a five picosecond delay. So this has a five picosecond delay here. And this is where it becomes interesting. Okay, so, oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, yeah, this is right. Okay, so what we're saying here is that between W and X, we have a five picosecond delay. Now, when W changes back high again, we should have a five picosecond delay to when X uh, goes back high again. But this happens to happen right when the clock edge is rising and this latch enters the hold mode. So we say in this scenario, the latch just enters the hold mode and there's no way for the data to get through. So the question, does this work? Yes, it does. And we say that T hold is actually approximately equal to negative 10 picoseconds. Okay, so yes, this is negative. So remember what the definition of hold time was, right? The definition was how long after the rising edge of the clock must we hold the input 
in order for it to latch th properly through the, the flip-flop. In this case, we say we need to hold input D minus 10 picoseconds after the rising edge of the clock, or said more reasonably, 10 picoseconds before the rising edge of the clock. Okay, so that's a little interesting. It's, a, it's, it's kind of based on how we've built this particular latch up. And it turns out that this is a little bit of a fuzzy number. I did put an approximate uh, sign there because technically we could have pulled it back another five picoseconds because it takes five picoseconds for X to, or for W to get through the, the transmission gate. But, you know, we want to be rather conservative here. We don't know exactly when the transmission gate turns on. It is presumably doesn't suddenly turn on, right? There's probably some propagation delay of the transmission gate itself turning on and so on. So this could be, if we were very optimistic, minus 15 picoseconds, but we're going to be a little conservative here and say it's minus 10, 10 picoseconds. Okay. So basically what this means is that you need to have your input D valid at least 15 picoseconds before the rising edge of the clock per the hold or per the setup time constraint. And then you need to have it valid again, a further five picoseconds uh, before that rising edge of the clock in order for that particular piece of data to make its way through that flip-flop. So you have this basically this minimum five picosecond um, setup hold aperture. Okay, in practice, what we tend to do is we tend to hold the data until after the rising edge of the clock, just to be safe. Remember, if we do have a hold time violation, this is disastrous for your design and you really don't want that to happen, right? So uh, please, again, uh, make sure to do keep that in mind, which is also why we tend to be a little conservative when we are computing our hold times versus our setup times, just because we really don't want to make a mistake with our hold times. So I recognize this is a little confusing, um, I do rec recommend reading the section on the book in this case. Uh, and, you know, once you kind of wrap your head around this, you realize, you know, it actually kind of makes sense. The, the key exercise here is let's let's move the edges of D back and forth until we have it in a position where we know things are working well. So, so far we've looked at kind of the basic latches and flip-flops that we can imagine. It turns out that, you know, these latches and flip-flops are built out of inverters, but there's nothing that says we must use inverters everywhere. We could use other gates. And if we use other gates, we can embed some amount of logic directly into our flip-flops. Uh, the most popular form of this is by building what we call resettable latches and flip-flops. Okay, this, it turns out, is actually a very important thing to, to study and, and know about. Remember when we were doing our timing diagrams, we always felt it was unsatisfactory when we didn't know what the input was previously, right? You know, when we're looking at this timing diagram and clock started at low, we said, well, we just don't know what the input was, so uh, let's call the output either one or zero, we just don't know. Now that's not a good thing to have in actual systems. You know, you don't want to start up your system and say, well, we don't know what state we're in. Let's just, you know, pick a random state. That's never a good strategy from a design perspective. So typically what we do when we when we turn on our system, we typically have a circuit called a power on reset that resets all of the flip-flops, all of the states and so on to known good states to make sure that we're starting off on the right foot. Okay, so this is why we might want to have a resettable latch or flip-flop. So it turns out there are two forms of uh, reset conditions. We can build a synchronous reset. And obviously if there's a synchronous reset, then there's also going to be an asynchronous reset. Okay, so let's uh, look at this uh, synchronous reset first. So the idea here is instead of building an inverter as that first gate in the flip-flop, you take input D and you pass it into a NAND gate with reset bar as the input. Okay, and then we go into our transmission gate. This is clock, clock bar. And in this case, I'm gonna draw this as a static latch. As follows, we have clock here and clock bar below. And output Q is right here. Okay, so to understand why we call this a synchronous 
reset. Let's again consider a timing diagram. Clock is zero, then it goes high. Let's say input D is just one, you know, whatever. Uh, and then let's say reset bar, uh, which is an active low reset, goes low, say, somewhere over here. Now, Q, the output of this latch, will not go low until after the rising edge of the clock. Okay, so even though reset bar goes down before the rising edge of the clock, that's when we're saying, well, that's where, when we're asserting the reset condition, we're saying, hey, begin to reset. This flip-flop doesn't actually reset its output until after the rising edge of the clock. So what we say here is that this is a flip-flop, or rather a latch, whose reset is synchronous with the clock. Okay, so what this means is the reset comes in, you know, some random time, but the, the flip-flop does not get resetted until after the rising edge of the clock. Okay, and, and the reason for this is because this reset signal is coming in as an input, right? And so because it's coming in as an input into the circuit, then we say that, you know, it can't get through the latch in any other way uh, until the latch enters the transparent mode. Okay, so that's a synchronous reset. So let's now look at an asynchronous reset. Okay, so it turns out that an asynchronous reset circuit looks pretty much the same as the other circuit. We have reset bar up here. We have D over here. We go through the same sort of transmission gate. So, so far we are identical. We go through our inverter here. We have our extra inverter to the output here to make sure that we don't have any um, weird uh, feedback noise that can uh, wreck things. So, so far this is the exact same circuit. The difference comes in is instead of using a tri-state inverter, we use what we call a tri-state NAND gate. Okay, so we have clock and clock bar coming in, and then we also happen to have reset bar coming through here. Okay, so again, let's look at a timing diagram. Clock looks something like this. Okay, input D, again, let's just say it's not changing, it's one and has always been one for a long time. Now, as soon as reset bar goes down, what happens to output Q? Well, reset bar as it goes into this first NAND gate is gonna have to wait until the latch enters the transparent mode in order to propagate its way out to Q bar. But there's another input with reset into this circuit here, it's coming in through this um, through this uh, uh, tri-state NAND gate. Okay, so in this particular case, when clock is low, the circuit is in the uh, hold mode, and and so as a result, any input that changes this hold mode condition is going to directly propagate to the output. So reset bar goes down. That's going to directly cause Q, or sorry, the output of this this feedback NAND gate to go high, which is going to cause Q to go down very quickly. Okay. So this is asynchronous with the clock. So the clock edge is over here, but basically, as soon as the reset condition is established, the circuit gets basically instantaneously reset. I mean, you have a propagation delay of the NAND gate and the inverter, but you don't have to wait for that rising edge of the clock. So hopefully that's clear why this is called an asynchronous reset. Now I should also mention that if the reset condition happens to happen when clock is high in this particular case, then the reset coming in through the tri-state NAND gate won't make its way through to the output, but of course the reset at the input NAND gate will because the latch is in the transparent mode. So it works asynchronously in both modes of operation. So, so far we've looked at um, uh, asynchronous and synchronous resets for latches. Let's now look at a more complete circuit. Let's call this a set and reset flip-flop. Okay, so not a latch anymore, but a flip-flop. 
And furthermore, we have the capability to do both set and reset functionality. So what does this circuit look like? We have input D, come in here, go through an inverter. We have a transmission gate. This is clock, clock bar. And in this case, we go through a NAND gate where we have set bar coming in over here. This then goes through a tri-state NAND gate with a reset bar over here, a bubble here, and this is clock, bar, and clock. And then this goes through another transmission gate, clock, and clock bar, which then goes through a NAND gate. This is a reset bar. There's a feedback NAND gate. And the only reason I draw the NAND gates this way is just uh, for convenient uh, bubble pushing purposes. And feedback over here. Now this is a tri-state. So it's clock and clock bar. Okay, and then finally through our last inverter out here, all the way to output Q. And I believe I have all of the labels on here. So I have a couple questions about the circuit. Uh, question one is, is this synchronous or asynchronous. Okay, so I'd like you to pause your video and just spend a moment to, to think about this before we just say the answer. Okay, so again, think about if a reset or a set condition happens, does this result get instantly pushed through to the output or do we have to wait for the rising edge of the clock? So take a moment to think about it. Okay, so hopefully you've thought about it a little bit here. Uh, it turns out that this is an asynchronous circuit. And the reason is, is because we have both our set and reset conditions directly available in that secondary latch there in both in, in the, uh, when it's in the hold mode. Um, and when it's in the transparent mode, we have the set and reset conditions in the previous latch uh, when that's in the hold mode, so that can propagate through to the output. So it doesn't matter if clock is high or low, or if it's risen or fallen or whatever. Um, we have uh, the, the set or reset condition uh, going right through to the output. So another question that, that I like to ask is, which is better? An asynchronous reset? or a synchronous reset. Okay, so this one is perhaps a little bit more difficult of a question to, to answer. So again, I encourage you, please pause your video, take a moment, think about this for, for, for just a few moments, see if you can come up with, a, with an answer. Okay, so hopefully you, you have indeed uh, paused the video and, and thought about this, um, but I'm sorry to say that there actually is no good answer here. Uh, the answer I'm gonna write down is it depends. Okay, so I did want you to think about this because anyone can make an argument for or against asynchronous or synchronous resets. There's pros and cons to both and one doesn't outweigh the other in most uh, conditions. Okay, so I would say, and this is my personal opinion, is that generally, Oops, let me write this actually because it's my personal opinion. Let me write it in a different color. Uh, generally, asynchronous reset is preferred. Again, my opinion only uh, due to its high priority and 
compatibility with clock gating. Oops, not which, with clock gating. And this, the, the latter point is actually perhaps one of the better reasons that, that I generally prefer an asynchronous reset is because in, in, in my designs, I tend to do a lot of low power design. Clock gating is a very effective technique in order to reduce power. We're going to talk a lot more about clock gating actually uh, coming up here. Um, and so a reset technique that is compatible with clock gating is indeed nice. Okay, so the reason why a synchronous reset is not compatible with clock gating because if the clock is gated to these flip-flops and you assert the reset signal, then those clocks aren't being gated. So they're never, or those flip-flops aren't being gated. So they're never going to get reset until they get clocked again. Okay. So that's, that's perhaps one reason. However, there are downsides uh, to a, an asynchronous reset. It is more susceptible to noise and glitches. Okay, so what I mean by that is if there's a little bit of noise on the reset line, um, you know, through some coupling, through some other wires or something like this, and it drops down a little too low, then it's possible it could accidentally reset your flip-flops on your chip. That would be a very bad thing to have happen. A synchronous reset is more resilient to that sort of thing because if you get a little glitch in the reset line as long as it doesn't happen during the setup hold aperture which is you know not a large percentage of the time then it doesn't matter it's not going to pass through and, and reset anything okay um, so for that reason synchronous resets are favorable uh, but in my opinion and again you can make good arguments one way or the other I believe the asynchronous reset benefits are uh, overwhelm the uh, detriments to it relative to a synchronous reset. Now be mindful about this reset terminal, make sure that it's going to be robust to glitching and so on when you're doing your design. So let's talk about clock gating now. I feel that now is an appropriate time to talk about this subject. Okay. so. Clock gating is uh, a potentially impactful way to reduce the activity factor in your dynamic power calculation. So the, the perhaps the easiest way to imagine a clock gating design, let's call this design option one, is the following. We have an array of D flip-flops, D, Q, they're clocked. Not going to draw, you know, a huge number of these. And basically, what we do is we take an AND gate, the output of which goes through to all of these flip flops, and we say this is clock, and we have some sort of enable signal. Okay, and so this node here, we're going to call it G clock or gated clock. Okay, so. Conceptually, this works okay, but in practice, we actually have some issues that, that happen here. So first of all, let's remind ourselves, why do this? Well, we have to recall that P equals CVDD squared F times alpha. Um, and we'll note that alpha is by definition equal to one for an ungated clock. Okay, so the idea here is it's better, therefore it's better to have um, alpha equals one at the AND gate input then at all the flip-flop the flip-flop uh, clock terminals right if there's a ton of clock uh, if there's a ton of flip-flops in a row here then C is going to be a huge number times alpha which is equal to 1 in this definition 
That is much worse than halving alpha equals one with C of the AND gate only. Uh, and then alpha is a very low number uh, for the rest of those flip-flops. Okay, so this seems like a good idea. All right, so what's the problem? So let's take a look again at a timing diagram. Surprise, surprise. Let's take a look at what happens in the following scenario. Uh, let me make my clock a nice 50% duty cycle clock here. Okay, there we go. So let's imagine that the enable signal looks something like this. Uh, let's say we have a short period of time we, when we don't have to clock the flip-flops. Now this is not really uh, a case when you would want to leverage clock gating, but you know we'll see why uh, this 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 is just an example, I guess. Okay, so let's take a look at the gated clock here. The gated clock is nothing more than an AND gate. Okay, um, and so what we can do is we can just draw dashed lines here at every possible edge and add the results together. So what we get here is a clock that looks something like this. Okay, so there's some bad things that are happening here. First of all, here, this is a short pulse. It's not a 50% duty cycle, um, so this is bad. We don't like this. But, you know, we could possibly live with this. What we can't live with is this thing over here. This is what we call a glitch. Okay, uh, this is very bad. And the reason it's very bad is that the this this is a there's a rising edge of the clock that is not synchronous with the rising edge of the normal system clock. Okay, normally in a in a circuit in a digital circuit, we have a clock signal and then the clock signal is synchronous across the whole circuit. So we have the same rising edge of the clock happening at the exact same time at all flip flops in our circuit. In this particular latter case, we have a rising edge of this gated clock that's happening basically in the middle of the clock period. This is a very bad time to be having a rising edge of the clock. We want it to be synchronous with the rising edge of the clock. Okay, so this is not a good way to implement clock gating. So a better way to accomplish clock gating is to use a, a different design. We'll call this design two. So the objective here is we want our gated clock to somehow be aligned with the normal clock. It turns out there's a very good way to do this and it's to use uh, a latch. Okay, so let's go ahead and understand uh, what this is gonna look like. So first we'll have our clock signal coming in here. And I'm gonna draw a very long wire before it hits an AND gate and creates our gated clock signal, G clock. Okay, uh, but before we hit that AND gate, we need to create an enable signal that is somehow synchronous with the rising edge of the clock. Okay, so the way that we do this is we pass the enable signal through a latch. A latch that is gated by the clock itself. Uh, in this case, we also need an um, inverted version of this clock. Okay, then we go through a, a normal static latch. Has some feedback through a tri-state inverter. This is clock, this is clock bar. Then we have this finally go through an inverter before it finally enters the gated clock. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw some, or annotate some nodes here. Let's say this is node X and this is node Y. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at a timing diagram. We have clock. Nice 50% clock waveform here. Okay, let's take a look at this example. And let's imagine, just for the purposes of this example, that we say enable goes down here, then it goes up here, and then it goes down over here. So very similar example to what we had in our previous uh, circuit. 
And remember, we don't normally, we wouldn't normally have an enable signal that goes low for, for such a short period of time. If that's the case, it's probably not worth gating the clock because uh, of all this extra overhead here. If you have your, your enable signal going down for long periods of time, that's when clock gating becomes worthwhile. So let's go ahead and take a look at node X. Okay, so this latch here happens to be a negative um, transparent latch. Okay, so when clock is low, this transmission gate is on. Okay, so when clock is low, we, the transmission gate is on. X is an inverted version through the transmission gate. So X starts at zero here. Okay, and then it enters the, when clock goes high, it enters the hold mode. So nothing can, can happen to the to node X here. So it just stays low. As soon as clock goes high, then X can finally latch in this enable transition here. And again, it holds it until the next falling edge of the clock, at which point it goes down. Um, and then it finally goes up over here. Okay, very good. What about Y? Y is just the inverted version of X. Okay, so I'm gonna draw this without appreciable delay, just to make things somewhat clear. Okay, so there's Y. So now let's take a look at the gated clock. So remember, the gated clock is now, it's the and of Y and clock. Okay, so clock is zero here. They're both high over here, and then they go low. And then in this case, uh, Y is zero, so we don't get that edge ever coming through. Uh, clock is zero in this case, and then finally clock goes high here and then back to zero over here. Okay, so importantly what we don't get is we don't get this short pulse over here that we otherwise would. And importantly, we don't get this glitch that we otherwise would if we were using just an AND gate. Okay, so we say here no glitches. And that's great. Okay, so the lesson here is that if you do want to do clock gating, don't just use an AND gate. Use an AND gate that has a latch built into it in order to make sure that the gated clock signal, this, gate, this enable signal that's going into this AND gate, is arriving synchronously with the rising edge of the clocks and importantly with the 50% duty cycle to make sure that your gated clock is synchronous with all the other clocks on your circuit.